Let's be honest folks, 2009 was, by all accounts, a terrible year for action games, with the only new releases gamers had to choose from being titles like Infamous, Batman Arkham Asylum, Mad World, Bayonetta. The people were starving for a new, bold action game, and who better to answer that hunger than Hungry? Welcome to Salmon TV, returning viewers and newcomers alike. I'm your host, Salmon, and today we're looking at X-Blades, a 2009 hack and slash by Hungarian developer Gaijin Entertainment. If anyone wants to tell me this game came out in 2008, no it didn't. That was the Russian release, and games only exist once they come out in English. And if X-Blades did come out in 2008, No More Heroes, Devil May Cry 4, Dark Messiah, Chains of Olympus, fucking Hellboy, The Science of Evil. Somebody's going to make me regret claiming Science of Evil is better. I don't know who, but they exist. Is it better? Maybe. I haven't played it. Signs of evil went, Sam. Alright, we have to address the elephant in the room because it has its tits hanging out and I wish it could just... not? Now, I've made some comments about fictional ladies in the past, but while Kanga is a cultured choice, this feels like a nudie mod that came pre-installed with the game. There is just... something about this design that my brain takes as a red flag. It reminds me of cheap waifu trash on Steam, like one of those games where you're just a busty anime girl with an AK shooting shit for no reason. What the fuck? This was seven years after Blood Rain, and while I haven't properly played through that game, I feel like X-Blades tries to do some of the same stuff. Both are action games starring a theoretically attractive lead, with combat mixing swordplay and firearms. But Blood Rain has the benefit of a protagonist who I actually think is pretty. And who wears more clothes. And the combat's better. I recorded 40 minutes of Blood Rain footage and had more fun than the six hours I put into X-Blades. The only thing I don't like is how Rain slurps when she's feeding. Mouth sounds make me uncomfortable, and not in a sexy way. It's just gross. I feel more comfortable comparing Blood Rain and Bayonetta as pretty lady action games. X-Blades isn't even on the radar. I hope you'll forgive me for all the uncanny anime booty you are about to see. In X-Blades, we take control of a Yumi, a treasure hunter searching for an ancient artifact said to hold immense power. As far as her personality goes, well, she likes money, and she works alone because a partner means less money. I'll tell you something. This, right here, when the cutscene ends without so much as a fade out and just drops you into gameplay in a totally different area than in the cutscene, that's when I knew this was going to be an episode. This was an officially released game for the PS3 and 360. South Peak saw this and was like, yeah, we'll publish it. At this point, I think seeing either South Peak or Topware's name on a game triggers my fight or flight response, which means you're probably going to ask me to review more games from them. Pretty sure the only thing South Peak put out that I liked was a legendary, and we'll get to that eventually. For now, prepare yourselves for a nuclear take. I don't think this game looks very good. During cutscenes, characters are rendered in a cel shaded fashion. It's not the best, but we're not playing the best, we're playing X-Blades. As soon as a cutscene is over, and I mean that literally because every single cutscene in the game just cuts to gameplay without a fade out, the characters are rendered in a more realistic style, including an HDR effect that I waited for a few levels before finally turning off because it's disgusting. Look at this. Anime characters are hard to make pretty in realistic lighting. That's just a fact, and why so many anime games opt to not include dynamic lighting and avoid natural textures for skin. This isn't a complaint, mind you, it's just an observation. But this? This is not helping me shake the Steam Greenlight vibes. This has Nintendo Hire This Man written all over it. Even the Temple of Ruins have a sort of stock asset feel to them. Alright, so normally I would feel inclined to skip the tutorial, but it's important that I walk you through the first stage of X-Blades because it is like a vertical slice of everything this game has to offer. It's impressive, really, and I think Gaijin Entertainment was really bold, really pushing the envelope, to start their game off by advertising that they don't know how a double jump works. Controls are always the hardest part of a game to describe, but I want you to just pantomime to yourself the input for a double jump. Just two quick taps, right? Maybe a little delay to extend your range, game permitting? Wrong. Neither of those would work because the input window lasts a tenth of a second right before Yumi hits the top of her arc. The only reliable way to double jump in X-Blades is not to press the jump button twice, but to mash the jump button. And if that doesn't convey what we're up against, I don't know what else to tell you. Oh, dodging, dodging. Okay, so you know how basically every game with a dodge just puts it on a button or has a strafing mode that lets you side hop? Flick the stick forward twice and hit jump. It's a special move imp It's a special move input for dodging. And I don't think you have any iframes while you're doing it, so it's pretty worthless. Like if you can't make the dodge work right, then just don't have a dodge, you know? We make our way into an arena and it begins to flood with enemies, and if I were to narrate a full playthrough of X-Blades, I would be repeating that about 30 more times. We're instructed to use our blades against these guar looking things, and by the time you're done killing the third or fourth monster, you might think, gosh, spamming basic attacks against grunts is kinda bland. Say, Ayumi has two swords, kinda like that damn Kratos, what with the gods of war. I'm betting she's got some cool combos. There are no combos. This action game from 2009, where the main character dual wields gun blades, 
has no combos. Okay, that's not 100% true. The game has special attacks you learn by collecting three pieces of differently colored artifacts to upgrade your melee, air attacks, and guns. But they require inputs on the analog stick that are just as precise as the double jump, so in the middle of a fight, you may as well not have them. In fact, the one time the game outright forces you to use a special move, it's against a single enemy who dies instantly from it. When you kill monsters, you collect their souls, a form of currency used to buy new abilities for Ayumi, upgrade her health regen, and increase how long she can be transformed once we unlock that. Alright, spoilers for this action game from 2009, you gain the ability to enter a transformed state where you do extra damage and move faster for a limited amount of time, which was super unique and no game had ever done before. You can also just outright pay souls in exchange for healing, and I'm not afraid to admit that I had to do this once or twice to escape a brush with death. Dying in this game just sets you back down at the beginning of the current room, which in any other game would be forgiving, except I'm playing X-Blades, so dying means I have to play more X-Blades. We're only able to buy the Earthquake power at the start, and with this I am given my newest thing to complain about, lengthy animations timed to moves that you are going to be using constantly. Area of effect spells like Earthquake, Fire Rage, Ice Flower, and Burst of Light all have an animation attached to them that stops gameplay dead. For a big screen clearing attack, that's perfectly fine because the delay helps build the sense of the move's power. But the damage output on these spells is such that you'll need to use it two to four times to kill a group. And that means watching that animation again and again and again. Sparkling Blade is probably the worst offender due to being a short range, single target spell. It kills basic enemies good, sure, but since enemies are designed to dogpile on you, spamming area spells is a better use of your mana. Speaking of mana, you notice how I seem to have an issue with all the core elements of this game? I'll say it now. Ayumi's spells are the real damage dealers of this game, and that's fine. Your swords are quick, but they don't do much damage. No, your swords are mostly for stunlocking mobs when you're surrounded and generating rage, which is this game's mana. Now, rage is interesting because it behaves like you'd expect. You gain it by dealing damage, and it fades away over time. That's... fine. Weird behavior for a resource used to cast spells, but I can get down with the idea of wizards who are just pissed off all the time. However, this is a highly questionable design choice to pair with bosses only take damage from spells. Imagine playing a sorceress in Diablo, but your mana pool drains constantly, forcing you to use your melee, and Frozen Orb is the only attack that damages the boss. That is X-Blades. But why Frozen Orb specifically? Why would I possibly imply that enemies only take damage from spells of specific before we get to that, back in the arena, we try out the guns a little. Right now, they're mostly good for killing flying enemies, but later in the game, they're mostly good for killing flying enemies. The gun doesn't give you rage, so don't bother shooting enemies you can hit with your sword. Even when you start fighting enemies that teleport away when you hit them, they're still too fast for the gun, you have to hit them with a spell. We'll unlock a scattershot and charge blast later, but the logic remains. Why shoot enemies and waste rage? So, our guns are useless, our swords are of limited usefulness, we can't double jump, we can't dodge. How can this get any... Oh no. So, I don't mind elemental weaknesses. They're fun, they encourage the player to pay attention, use magic, and strategize how best to take down a group of monsters. It would be hypocritical of me to enjoy Pokemon but hate the concepts of elemental weakness and resistance. But there are games with what I call exceptional weakness. What does that mean? Well, in RPGs with exceptional weakness, an enemy's weakness is like a hole in otherwise perfect armor. If you're an ice elemental, for example, you're weak to fire. And only fire. And now, my friends, we are truly playing X-Blades. Anything stronger than a grunt enemy is like this. You will need some spell, even if it's just adding an element to your swords, to do reasonable damage to them. Which means that most of your time will be spent wailing on trash mobs so you can get the rage to dispatch stronger enemies and bosses. You'll also find these red crystals that fill your rage bar. Those are very useful, but then you realize that dumping your whole rage bar into a boss only takes out a chunk of their health. You only have four spell slots, and ignore how they're arranged here like a D-pad. You don't use the D-pad, they're bound to Y, B, L, B, and RB. And so most every fight will include needing to pause the game, scroll through your spell list, select the four new spells you need to kill the new batch of enemies, then proceed. There is, luckily, a bestiary that includes the weakness of any monster you've encountered, which was how I was able to figure out that this bastard lizard boss that spits fireballs is weak to fireballs. Which still makes my head hurt, because no other enemy is like that. Also, if you dodge his fireballs, they loop back around and hit you from behind? So fuck him. The game will spawn like 15 smaller versions of him later, but at least they come one at a time. Still tedious. Most bosses are just beefed up versions of grunt enemies, and the best strategy is to just circle strafe and spam the appropriate projectile spell until they die. And if you lack that spell, well, you'll need to backtrack and grind souls to unlock it. Luckily, you can't be softlocked by entering a boss room without the needed spell, but it also means the progress is less tied to your ability to kill the boss, so much as it is your ability to purchase the one move that deals damage. Sometimes a boss will have grunts that make them invincible, so you need to destroy those first, but sometimes those grunts just instantly respawn, so you actually need to freeze them. I should probably talk about the story. 
There isn't much, but the game does have one. If you don't want to be spoiled about the plot of this 2009 action game, look away. Though I basically already spoiled the whole thing for you by saying the gameplay's trash. So, Ayumi's map leads her to the artifact that she'd been searching for, only to find out that it's being guarded by a lion man. Ayumi touches the orb, releasing the power inside and giving herself magic powers. More than she already had, anyway. And now we need to circle strafe this lion man until he goes down. Unfortunately, the orb seemed to also contain some really evil shit, so Ayumi blacks out and wakes up on the shore of another temple. Several rooms and five million lizard men later, we encounter the game's most deadly foe, an unreasonably drawn out spiky floor sequence. We're saved by Jay, he's some sort of monk for the god of light we circle strafed back in the first temple, and it seems that Ayumi has been cursed by the god of darkness who now resides here. Eventually we meet him, he's another lion man, and since he reflects fireball, we have no other choice but to spam earthquake and shining blade. More rooms, a spider boss we circle strafe with fireballs, and we're up against the evil lion man again for the second time. Reusing bosses isn't a huge crime, and he does have some new moves, so I won't add suckness to the game for this. After he's defeated again, Ayumi touches the Dark God's orb, but while it does seem to remove the curse from her body, it does so by transferring it into Jay, who runs off. That probably won't come up later. More rooms, a robot we circle strafe with lightning, and now it's time to fight the Lion Man for the third damn time, and as we know, furries will not be tolerated. At least this fight has this neat gimmick where he becomes intangible and you need to extinguish elemental torches with their opposing elements to make him phase back in. I said neat, not fun. When he goes down, Jay arrives in a DIY Vanitas cosplay, kills the Lion Man, and attacks us. He's been taken over completely by the Dark God's magic, truly gone to the dark side, so I'm sure his boss fight will be super exciting, and Jay's boss fight is tedium incarnate. So to damage him, you need light magic, which I have, but again, only light magic hurts him, and all he summons are flying minions that are hard to melee to generate rage. Be very careful trying to shoot them down, because Jay has a second quirk that got on my nerves really fast. If you hit him with a physical attack, even a stray gunshot, he will freeze you solid. So the main strategy is to camp out on this respawning rage crystal, kill his phantoms, then spam the light spell. This is the penultimate fight, and he barely feels different from any other boss. Jay retreats into the castle and we pursue, wading through chambers, crawling with waves upon waves of lizard men, just mindless amounts of lizard men before we reach the final chamber and it's the same fight it's the same fight again but he's a bit easier because he doesn't summon ghosts no second stage no giant form no cool theatrics nothing he's the final boss and you circle straight him spamming projectile spells this is the end the climax of x blades the final test of your skills after six hours of slaughtering lizard men drink it in you earned this if you never bought a dark spell throughout your playthrough, you get the good ending where Ayumi purifies Jay and expels evil from the world. If you did buy a dark spell, you kill Jay. Which is... somehow the bad ending? I think the game expects me to care more about Jay than I do. We only interacted with him like twice. With that, we finally finished X-Blades. For those brave enough to play the game again, finishing the game unlocks two new outfits for Ayumi, one which causes her to regenerate health constantly, and another which reduces damage from attacks. While both are still rather skimpy, they at least offer a bit more coverage. You don't need me to say I think X-Blades is a bad game. It's six hours of button mashy busy work that seems to have been designed to deny the player any sort of satisfaction from completing a challenge. It's awkward to play, unpleasant to look at, the music is actually pretty good, it's sort of industrial and it reminds me of combat music from Spider-Man 2, but the game simply got too little going on under the hood to get away with being so light on story. I'd be more forgiving if the gameplay had been more engaging, but X-Blades just fails to hit the mark in almost every regard. X-Blades is the worst thing a game can be. It's boring. Hungarians, I know this might be hard to hear, but this game sucks. And that's it for X-Blades, without a doubt the worst game I've talked about on this channel so far, and the debut of our new rating system. Because using a pass-fail system to rate video games isn't a ridiculous idea at all, and I totally won't regret naming it that. In 2013, Gaijin Entertainment would try to reboot the X-Blades series with Blades of Time, a spiritual successor with Ayumi returning after a much-needed redesign. But that, my friends, is a story for another day. Now, if you'll excuse me, I'm gonna play Ben 10 Protector of Earth. Sure, it's one of the millions of brawlers that plagued the PS2, but at least it has combos. Have a good one, folks. Thanks for watching. Remember to like and subscribe. The Patreon's in the description. Okay, cue the B-roll.